talk to you about this afternoon's um, presentation by Amy Hulick, who has come down with her husband Chris from North Bend, Washington, just to be with you. After two years of trekking and kayaking and bush planing through uh, the Tongass Forest, she uh, discovered some remarkable things. She has beautiful pictures that she has produced in her book, Salmon in the Trees. She will explain that title to you. Not only of animals and glaciers and mountains and the forest. In fact, your city, uh, part of the old um, coastal rainforest. The forest has been cut, but the rain's still with us. <laughs> Her book, Salmon in the Trees, has run, uh, won many awards. Even Art Wolf gave her a, a, a compliment that you can see on the cover. It, not, it has profiles of the native towns and beautiful photographs of uh, the native people whose traditions are sometimes being lost and sometimes being perpetuated and She'll tell you what to do, what we should all do, and how we should all think about maintaining the Tongass Forest, the largest national forest in the United States. So welcome to Amy Hewitt. Scott for making sure we have something for you to look at uh, today. That's always really helpful. <laughs> uh, and a big thank you for all of you for coming out in the middle of the day um, on a Sunday. I really appreciate you taking time out of your lives to be here today. It's kind of doesn't really work if I'm the only one standing up here. <laughs> nobody out here. Don't really like talking to myself any more than I need to. Um, so I'm a, I'm a photographer and a writer, and uh, I'm often asked, uh, what are the hazards of, of being a nature photographer, um, uh, particularly one who spends a lot of time in these remote wilderness areas, um, like I do? Um, is it things like traveling in bear country, uh, negotiating a class four river, um, or flying in a bush plane with the door off? <laughs> and while well, all of these things are potentially hazardous, um, I have to say that they somewhat pale in comparison to something else, and um, that would be curiosity. Um, to do what I do, make pictures that tell stories, you have to have a healthy amount of curiosity to sustain your interest uh, for often the, the long time that these stories can, can take to tell. And so why well, would that be hazardous? Well, you've probably all heard the phrase, curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> And while my curiosity, as far as I know, hasn't actually killed anyone, um, those who know me well, uh, particularly my husband in the back there, uh, will attest that I often drive people mad with my endless questions of why things are the way they are. And those of you who have raised small children, um, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and I just never really outgrew that phase, I think. So questions like, you know, why is the sky blue? Why aren't our two snowflakes ever the same? And why are there salmon in the trees? And it's this last question that I've spent several years of my life pursuing. And while no one was killed or injured in the making of this story, uh, the journey became somewhat of an obsession for me, um, fueled by curiosity. But if curiosity killed the cat, then satisfaction brought it back. And I'm honored to be here to tell you the story uh, that I brought back uh, from my adventures pursuing the story of salmon in the trees. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have, but if you could please hang on to them until the end, uh, that would be great. Um, so if we could get the lights. Perfect. That'd be perfect. Okay. That's great. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, all the all the photographs of mine and the illustrations that you'll see sprinkled throughout um, are uh, by Ray Troll. Some of you may know him, uh, well-known in Alaska, a great fish artist, um, and pretty well-known down here uh, in the Pacific Northwest, too, but just terrific, terrific person. So, so where to begin this crazy quest for salmon in the trees? Well, before I left home, a friend gave me some, some sound advice. He said, 
remembering a journey of a thousand miles can end in failure. <laughs> yeah, good confidence builder there. <laughs> so at the start, all I knew was that I needed to go to Alaska. <laughs> but Alaska is so mind-boggling in its size, it would be like saying I needed to go to Africa. Alaska is by far our largest state. It's more than twice the size of Texas. Texans really don't like uh, hearing that, <laughs> but it, it is. Uh, and most of us, um, if we haven't been to Alaska, most of us tend to think that all of the state is this vast frozen expanse with roaming polar bears, and if there are any people at all, uh, they must live in igloos and travel by dog sled. And while that's a somewhat uh, accurate description of some parts of Alaska, where I needed to go uh, is not what comes to mind when we think of our 49th state. I was going to the rainforest of Alaska. Now, I don't know about you, but I always thought that rainforests were in Brazil and in Indonesia, uh, warm places near the equator with parrots and primates and pythons. Well, those are tropical rainforests, also called jungles. Uh, the rainforest of Alaska is what's called a coastal temperate rainforest, which you know this uh, climate very well uh, living here. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is this is one of the rarest ecosystems uh, on the planet. Now most of Alaska's rainforest is in what's called Southeast Alaska. This is also known as the panhandle of the state. Uh, all more famously, it's known as the Inside Passage for anyone cruising all the sheltered waterways uh, that weave among uh, thousands of islands. Now, almost 80% of Southeast Alaska is the Tongass National Forest. So anywhere on the map where you see in green, uh, that's all Tongass National Forest. So this is a place uh, where the forest meets the sea. A cloud slam up against this jagged coast range that separates Alaska and British Columbia on the mainland, and this creates rain. Uh, lots and lots of rain. More than 200 inches a year in some places nourish this coastal forest. So in places, um, this place gets twice the amount of rain, or even more than twice the amount of rain that you get here in the hot. So something to compare that to. Uh, I quickly learned uh, why <coughs> extra tough rubber boots uh, are an essential part of every Southeast Alaskan wardrobe. <laughs> yes, the, the Alaska fishermen in the front here is laughing. Yes, you live in these things, you know this. And the people, what I, what I love, it's like people just don't wear these on their fishing boats or out in nasty weather. They wear them to weddings, uh, they wear them to the opera. I'm pretty sure they wear them to bed. I mean, these just never come off. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. Uh, even the babies are extra tough here. <laughs> so much of the Tongass had spread out um, over 5,000 islands in what's called the Alexander Archipelago. And in part because of this, no point on land is very far from the sea. And at times, this line is blurred between where the forest ends and the sea begins. So you'll see things here uh, like grizzly bears uh, digging for clams on the beaches. Um, I didn't know that bears uh, eight clams until visiting this part of the world. Uh, marbled murelets, um, this is a seabird that nests high in the trees and yet feeds in the ocean. Um, so again, another one of those species that relies on both land and sea. Uh, humpback whales cruise right along the forested shorelines. And this is always my favorite. So now you're in the woods and you're, you're not even thinking about the ocean and you're a couple miles away on a trail and all of a sudden you look down and something from the sea has been dragged and dropped uh, by ravens or otters or uh, some other uh, animal. So again, just kind of really talks about how interconnected the forest and the sea uh, here are. So at 17 million acres, this is about the size of the state of West Virginia, uh, the Tongass is by far our country's largest national forest. It's more than three times the size of the second largest national forest, which is the Chugach, which is just north um, of the Tongass. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, that I think you can all relate to. <laughs> uh, about 70,000 people live in this part of Alaska, uh, but because of all the islands and the rugged mountains, um, the most reliable modes of transportation here are not uh, automobiles, uh, but instead they are boats. Uh, there are no roads that connect another island to another island. There are no bridges that connect another island to another island. So. You don't get very far uh, in an automobile, but uh, on a boat, the world is your oyster. Um, this is Creek Street uh, in Ketchikan. This is the Alaska State Ferry, so it's a fantastic way uh, to get around up there. 
and um, seaplanes uh, act as taxis, uh, in good weather anyway. So while I had narrowed my search uh, for salmon in the trees uh, to a relatively small portion of Alaska, uh, it would still take a lifetime uh, to explore all uh, of the Tongas. So, so where to start and how to get around in this land of islands and jagged peaks? Well, I decided to do something that I really did not want to do, and that was fly in a small plane with the door off. <laughs> um, this is definitely a potential hazard, and uh, don't recommend doing this. And don't let that smile fool you. Um, it is one of madness and not joy. Uh, but the pilot assured me that I'd be strapped in with fail-safe buckles and a barrier across the opening. Well, I showed up, and um, he gave me this frayed lap belt that looked like it was out of uh, like a 1970s station wagon. Um, and just a lap belt, no shoulder strap. Uh, just the biggest loser. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I'll get up. <laughs> um, yeah, so just that lap belt, no shoulder strap. Um, uh, and then, you know, he promised me that the buckle was. something so that buckle doesn't like just fly open and when we're up in the air. So he goes, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, he, gave, he gives me some tape <laughs> to put on the buckle. I'm thinking, okay, duct tape, gorilla tape, that might, I, I think I'd be okay with that. No, he gives me like a little piece of like black electrical tape. <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, I mean, like, alarm bells, like everything was going off in my head, like don't do this, don't do this. Um, oh, and then, and then he did say there'd be a barrier across that opening. I'm like, okay, where's the barrier? I'm thinking like steel cable. And he, he takes out this little frayed clothesline. <laughs> like, like a cotton piece of rope. And like, just, you know, that wasn't going to do anything. Um, anyway, so, but a couple moments later, against all better judgment, um, I was in the air. <laughs> um, now, I thought if I closed my eyes, that maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But that would kind of defeat the whole purpose of doing what I was doing. <laughs> um, it only took a few minutes, though, um, for my fear to sort of disappear, um, because the beauty below me just took my breath away. Uh, or maybe it was that cinch seatbelt that was strangling uh, my circulation. I had I never had a seatbelt tied there, <laughs> cinched that tight. So I did this against my better judgment, because I wanted to get a big picture uh, view of this immense region, because it is just so huge. And from the air, it's easy to see uh, that the Tongass is a giant mosaic of very different landscapes. And while the Tongass is a national forest, only about 60% is actually forested. The rest looks a lot like this. Um, rock, ice, wetlands, more than 20,000 lakes and ponds, and 40,000 miles of streams. 
Now, during the last ice age, uh, parts of Southeast Alaska were completely covered in ice, and uh, glaciers have played a very large role in sculpting the, the Tongass into what we all see it as uh, today. So all of the straits and inlets uh, of the inside passage of Southeast Alaska are glacial fjords uh, gouged by the Pleistocene glaciers, which bore deep into the bedrock uh, well below sea level. And then when those glaciers started to recede, um, salt water then flooded all of these valleys. Tidewater glaciers, uh, like you see here, these are where the ice and sea actually meet. And they're found in three areas of Southeast Alaska. Uh, one more famously known uh, as Glacier Bay National Park, and appropriately named. The other two are in the Tongass National Forest. Um, again, this is another thing that makes the Tongass unique. This certainly isn't what you think of when you hear the words uh, national forest. So from the air, you get this big uh, glacial picture of the region, but nothing will help you understand the forces of glaciers more uh, than actually being on one. And even better, if you can, uh, safely, is being under one. Um, it is here where the glacier seems most alive. Uh, where rock and ice are kind of duking it out with one another. And through sheer weight, uh, the ice bears down and the rock gives in. But long after the glaciers retreat, uh, that rock bounces back. And the land here in Southeast Alaska has been free from this enormous weight of ice and it's uplifted in a process called isostatic rebound. And in places, the land has risen uh, hundreds of feet and it's still rising today in this geologically active uh, part of the world. So this gives new meaning to the term waterfront property. Uh, if you have waterfront property, you might find yourself with a whole lot more. Um, a woman that I met up there, her family uh, homesteaded some land um, in the 60s, and just a few years ago, she just um, accreted another 40 acres uh, of land, um, all due to uh, uplifting. So again, very uh, active part of the world. So what do glaciers have to do with salmon in the trees? Why am I talking about these things? Well, when the glaciers retreated, um, some new occupants uh, then moved in. Uh, things like um, seeds, uh, spores, uh, bugs, uh, shrubs, uh, birds, uh, beavers, trees, deer, uh, wolves, uh, fish, uh, bears, uh, and people. And uh, the forest was born. So uh, in 1916, almost 100 years ago, um, this is where the glacier was, like right up near that rock. So you can kind of get a sense that, yes, indeed, a forest has moved in as that, as that glacier has uh, receded. And it is in the forest, of course, where I'm going to find trees and perhaps salmon in the trees. And besides, I won't have to be up in that airplane and I can be safely uh, back on the ground. Although safe is a relative term here. <laughs> So one of the world's highest densities of brown bears, also called grizzly bears, lives here, as well as the highest density of black bears in the world. And the forests are quite thick, so it's not like you can see a bear coming a mile away. Uh, sometimes you can't even see a bear coming a few footsteps away. So surely if I stayed back out in the water, I'd, I'd be okay, right? Well, bears can swim. And the sea is loaded with large creatures with big teeth uh, as well. So at certain times of the year, it's hard to look anywhere on or under the water and not see something stunning. Uh, dolls' porpoises have been clocked at speeds of 30 knots, and they may be the fastest of all the small cetaceans. Uh, when I plunged into the icy waters here, again, against my better judgment, um, I was astounded at all of the colorful life. Uh, this is a China rockfish uh, that's cold water Gorgonian corals. Um, I didn't know that corals grew at such a northerly latitude and in such cold water, but there they are. And rockfish are fascinating. Um, there are many different species of rockfish and no one knows for certain just how long they live, but they have dated some of upwards of 100 to 125 years old. Um, yeah, that is, they don't really get that big. Um, so that's a, that is a, uh, an old fish. Um, these are sea anemones, and certain parts of the area here, are just uh, the rock walls are just plastered with them. And these are what are called nudibranchs, um, also known as slugs of the sea, and uh, just a little bit more beautiful than the slugs of the land. <laughs> uh, but whenever I was underwater, it was always these guys, the stellar sea lions, that would buzz me pretty much any chance that they could. And you have no idea just how fast and how powerful they are 
uh, until you find yourself face to face with one, or ten, uh, because they seem to roam around in large gangs. There's never just one. Uh, for sheer size, though, here, uh, nothing beats the humpback whale. So humpbacks uh, migrate to this area every spring, uh, traveling thousands of miles from their birding grounds uh, in places like Hawaii, uh, to dine on this rich smorgasbord of herring and small shrimp called krill. And sometimes the whales employ a technique called bubble net feeding. And this is when they spiral upward and they blow a curtain of bubbles that confuses and corrals the prey. And the whales then burst through the surface and they scoop up all those lassoed rewards. And there's nothing quite as thrilling uh, as being in the middle of a pod of humpback whales. But if you're in a hurry to get somewhere, um, they can be quite annoying because they will disrupt your schedule. And while they sucked hours of days away from my search for salmon in the trees, um, I have to admit that they were a most welcome uh, distraction. <laughs> so do I travel here by land or by sea? Well, both. Uh, that's how the native people lived for thousands of years, and today people's lives here are very much tied uh, to both. Uh, the Tongass is uh, traditionally uh, Clinket Indian territory, and in more recent times, uh, home to some Haida and uh, Simshin people as well. And most native peoples of this area, they traditionally located their villages just above high tide line. Uh, the tidal exchanges in this part of the world are huge, uh, more than 20 feet uh, in most places. And with clams, seaweed, gumbo chitons, and other food sources right out their front door, uh, the native folks have a saying um, that I really like, and it very much holds true uh, today. Uh, they say, when the tide is out, the table is set. <laughs> Since time immemorial, the sea has been an important food source for the first peoples of the Tongass, and uh, very much continues to be so uh, today. Uh, these are two young men uh, in the village of Cake, uh, filleting a halibut that then gets distributed to uh, the community. Uh, these are other uh, community members uh, preparing smoked salmon there in the background, and in the foreground, that is smoked uh, seal meat, harbor seal meat, and braided and smoked uh, seal intestine. Um, which to us doesn't necessarily sound appetizing, but um, I'm a big believer that when in Rome, you should do as the Romans do, and so I, um, I always like to try uh, food that local people eat. Um, and it was actually pretty good. It's very chewy, um, but it'll be good. For someone who's not used to the, that kind of food, I actually, I found it interesting. <laughs> uh, so again, the sea is very important. The forest is very important as well um, uh, for things like berries and medicinal plants. Uh, trees for totem poles, uh, longhouses, uh, and for weaving materials. And it's no surprise that the artworks, dances, and oral histories of the native folks in the Tongass region are rich with stories of people and creatures like salmon, bears, and whales transforming into one another. Uh, clans like killer whale, frog, and wolf uh, speak to the importance of both the land and the sea. Uh, so here in the native cultures, uh, the family lines follow the mother, and people belong to one of two major groups uh, known as moieties. So in this part of the world, you are either eagle or you are raven. And I had the honor of spending time uh, with many native people who allowed me a glimpse uh, into their culture. In the village of Kalak on Prince of Wales Island, uh, I spent time in John Rowan Jr.'s carving shed. Uh, John is Clinket Eagle of the Shank Waibu Wolf Clan. Uh, he's also a United States Marine, uh, and he's a native arts teacher, instructing students in things like uh, carving, uh, language, oral history, uh, and dancing. And in addition to teaching the next generation of kids, uh, John is overseeing the carving of the third generation of uh, totem poles for his village. This has been an enormous undertaking for him. Uh, it's 21 poles in all, with at least 250 hours uh, going into each one. And when I met him, I think he was about halfway through, and just a few, I think just a year or two ago, uh, they just erected uh, the final uh, poles. Um, so again, uh, enormous undertaking. Uh, carving next to John, this is 15-year-old Noelle Demmer. Uh, she's Clinket Eagle of the Cogwan Tan clan, and she's the lead carver on this totem pole to honor a Haida man who carved and gifted the canoe to the people of her village. And John told me that not too long ago, and I'm surprised to hear this, but he said, you know, just you know, several uh, decades ago, uh, the native people were just barely hanging on to their culture by their fingernails. Um, no one was really carving. Uh, people weren't you know, uh, making the, the beautiful button blanket robes. No one was weaving the beautiful um, cedar and, and spruce hats. 
Um, but he says today, uh, in reading more recent times, um, there has been a, a quite a resurgence uh, in their culture, and he hopes that the youth uh, grab hold and run with it. And from everywhere I traveled around, um, that was certainly the case. I was very honored to attend uh, the poll raising ceremony uh, for the poll that Noel carved under John's watchful eye. Uh, if you ever have a chance to attend the poll, poll raising ceremony, um, I strongly suggest that you go. They are just very, very powerful uh, events. Um, it's an occasion of a great celebration uh, where the people dress in their clan regalia and perform uh, traditional dances and songs. Uh, so this is Noel, the young woman uh, that you saw earlier carving. And uh, this is John, uh, proudly uh, looking on. And no celebration uh, like this would be complete uh, without a feast, uh, including salmon, uh, one of the most important food sources for the native cultures um, and a critical part of the economy uh, for many people uh, in this region. So salmon and trees, that's right, focus on my quest. So you can see how easy it is to get distracted here. Uh, there are just so many incredible topics and subjects and, and people, wildlife, uh, everywhere. Uh, and as a photographer, uh, again, it's tough to stay focused. Um, but where there are salmon fishermen, uh, there must be salmon, I'm hoping. Um, so I hook up with Carl Jordan. Carl is a fourth generation Alaska salmon fisherman. Uh, he's based out of Sitka on Baranoff Island. And Carl tells me he's proud to catch what he considers the best food in the world. And there will be no argument from me on that one. Uh, 28 years old, um, I think Carl's more in tune with his connection to the natural world than most people twice his age. Uh, his commute aboard his 38-foot trolling boat uh, takes him past forested islands and breaching whales. Uh, he looks for seabirds feeding on herrings is a good sign that salmon may be present. Uh, weather, tides, water temperatures all guide his decisions, and he knows he's part uh, of an intricate web. And Carl is typical of many fishermen in the Tongass region, and I think that most of us, I know I was certainly surprised to learn that it's small mom and pop operators like him that are delivering the best food in the world to our grocery stores and our restaurants. Um, so this is Carl's young family, and they double as his crew. So he's <laughs> making the little girls swab the deck there. <laughs> and Carl tells me he's very thankful for the salmon because not only do they allow him to uh, uh, make a living doing this and provide for his family, uh, but they also do all of us this awesome service by nourishing uh, our bodies with incredibly healthy food. And then Carl tells me something that kind of makes my head spin. He says that when the salmon swim into the forest, they nourish the trees, too. Could this be salmon in the trees? I promptly thank him, I jump off his boat, and I head back to the land. So now I needed to find salmon in the forest, and I asked the wildlife biologist where to go. And he said, well, any stream. Now, given that I didn't have an entire lifetime to explore the 40,000 miles of streams in the Tongass, um, I asked if he might be a little bit more specific. And he repeated, as if I were a stubborn child who was pestering him with a silly, curious question. Any stream? Well, he was pretty much right. So when you go looking for salmon in streams, you will almost certainly see bears as well, uh, whether you want to or not. And on Admiralty Island here, um, it'd be highly unusual not to see bears, and that's where I was headed. So the Clicket people, they call this island Kutsnuu, uh, which translates uh, into Fortress of the Bears. It's an appropriate name. Uh, Admiralty has one of the highest densities of brown bears in the world, an average of nearly one bear per square mile. Mm -hmm. Now, Alaskans know just how many bears that is, uh, but usually when I'm down here in the lower 48, um, it, it helps to compare. So I say, you know, whenever you're in a more densely populated area, if you're in a city or something, every time you see a Starbucks or a McDonald's, just replace that with a bear. Because that's <laughs> pretty much how many bears are on the island. Yeah, and funny thing was, is I was, I was telling that story to an audience in Alaska, and a little boy turned to his mom and said, Mom, is that really how many McDonald's are in the lower 48? She <laughs> <laughs> just stunned by that. <laughs> So a uh, little bit about islands uh, before I go back into Admiralty here. So islands, uh, again, this is a land of islands up here. So think of islands worldwide, like the Galapagos or Hawaii. Uh, these are living laboratories uh, for studying the effects that islands have on the distribution of animals and plants. Um, the islands of the Tongass here are no exception. So the mix of wildlife that ends up on an island, uh, 
It's a combination of many different factors, uh, things like time, uh, chance, uh, mobility, uh, predation, and, uh, and animal resistance uh, to drowning. So in the Tongass, if you don't want to see brown bears, um, then there are three islands that you should not visit. Uh, these are Admiralty, Baranoff, and Chichagoff, and these are known collectively as the ABC Islands. They're the three largest islands uh, in the Tongass. Now it's interesting, there are no black bears on these three islands, although black bears are plentiful on other islands, and both brown and black bears live on the mainland together. And scientists studying the brown bears on these ABC islands, they theorize that they're descendants of a long isolated group, and believe it or not, they're more closely related to polar bears than they are to the uh, brown bears on the mainland. And this research supports the idea that there were pockets of land uh, called refugia that were not entirely covered by ice during the last ice age. And it's fascinating to contemplate the past, but the second that you step foot on Admiralty Island, all that really matters is the present. There's nothing like being in a place known as the Fortress of the Bears uh, to make you acutely aware of the here and now. <laughs> You're in someone else's home, <laughs> someone a lot bigger and stronger than you are, and it'd be nice to return to your own home uh, at some point. So this is what's left of the trailhead marker. Uh, <laughs> bears get uh, chewing it, apparently they like cedar. <laughs> so when you arrive here in Admiralty, you're on your very best behavior. Uh, it's as if Miss Manners or the Queen of England herself uh, greeted you at the shores of the island. So you announce yourself. Uh, you're considerate, you're super clean with your food, and you give your host, particularly the lady of the house and her offspring, plenty of personal space. Now, if you do all of these things, you'll likely have a pleasant visit, uh, perhaps extraordinary. So the mouth of Pat Creek on Admiralty Island, this is a beautiful example of a rich estuary. Um, this is a place where freshwater streams empty into protected bays of the coastline. And an estuary is in a constant state of flux as the tides ebb and flow. Fine sediments are pushed into this intertidal area and this supports the growth of salt-tolerant plants. Now biologically, uh, estuaries are highly productive areas um, supporting a rich mix of both uh, terrestrial uh, and marine life. Uh, nutritious sedges, uh, like you see here, uh, grow in estuaries and they nourish many uh, different animals. Uh, I had no idea just how much salad bears will eat uh, until I watched them grazing uh, day after day on sedges. And when I visited Admiralty Island in early August, uh, the salmon were leaving the ocean and entering uh, this estuary. And sure enough, there were plenty of bears waiting for them. Now, there's nothing like watching bears in their home, and at Pack Creek, there are no fences, there's no guard dogs uh, keeping watch over us. The only thing that separates us here uh, is respect, and that's respect on our part. So when you arrive on Admiralty by boat or float plane, because that's the only way to get there, um, you arrive over here somewhere, and then you walk out onto this little spit, and on that little trail, and you sit right there in that viewing area, and then you hope that uh, bears are coming in, and those two little brown dots there, um, those are bears, but we have them come and like run right through our viewing area. Um, so that's the on-the-ground version of what I just showed you from the air. Again, there's nothing, there's no fences, there's no tower, there's no platform. Um, it's just you and grass and bears. <laughs> um, and it seemed like that for the most part, as long as we stayed in our space and our behavior was predictable, um, the bears seemed to uh, go about their day and pretty much uh, ignore us. Um, but every now and then, uh, a younger bear would get chased into our space or right near it by a more dominant bear. Or sometimes I think a bear just gets curious, you know, maybe as to who we are and, and what we're doing up there. And these are the encounters that you don't ever forget. And you don't ever forget who is in charge. Uh, one evening, our commute back to our camp uh, was delayed until this bear uh, wandered away from our vehicle. So I'm watching the bears here because the salmon are here. But why are the salmon here? Well, salmon are remarkable creatures. They're born in freshwater streams and rivers, they head out to the oceans to mature, and then they return to their birth streams as adults to spawn the next generation. Now think about that for a minute. The salmon are out there in the ocean, thousands of miles away from where they were born, and somehow, at just the right time, they find their way back to the very place where they started their lives. To me, that's just got to be one of the greatest feats of nature. 
Now, the Tonga supports all five species of Pacific salmon. And every summer and fall, millions of wild salmon fill nearly 5,000 spawning streams found throughout the Tongas. And this is the time of year when this whole place comes alive, uh, just erupts with, with life. So where there's a concentration of food, uh, the crabs show up. Uh, not unlike a Friday night all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> So the great numbers of salmon help to explain uh, why the Tongass region supports the world's highest nesting density of bald eagles and why there are 80 bears here for every one bear found inland far from salmon streams. And to watch this feeding frenzy, uh, for me, has got to be one of the greatest spectacles on our planet. Um, at least 50 species have been documented feeding on salmon here, uh, among them uh, black bears, brown bears, gulls, uh, ravens, uh, river otters, bald eagles, uh, mink, uh, the mountain sea, um, seals, sea lions, uh, orcas, and um, people. <laughs> I know I eat the way the salmon's returned. <laughs> Uh, even more astounding, though, to me, is that enough salmon dodged this deadly obstacle course of the beaks and jaws of animals, as well as the nets and hooks of people, to sustain their populations year after year. And they've been doing this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Now, during salmon time, uh, the competition for food can be quite fierce, as uh, every bird, beast, and fisherman for himself. And while the larger animals usually have first dibs on salmon, um, sometimes there are other ways to get a meal. Um, so the eagle here in the center, uh, he has uh, a salmon carcass in his talon, and the eagle on the left here is uh, contemplating perhaps stealing it, uh, because that's much easier than going out and uh, doing the work yourself. So these two eagles are gonna have a little standoff here, and, but while they're doing this, keep an eye on Raven there uh, on the right. Um, so this is great typical eagle behavior. He's standing on his food, he's guarding his food, he's vocalizing, he's pretty much shrieking, uh, you know, stay away from my food or I'm gonna beat you up. Uh, and the eagle on the left there is being very submissive, has his head down, um, but he's still eyeing that salmon, right? So while this little squab squabble is going on, um, what do you think Raven's going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it just doesn't take long sitting there and watching ravens to understand why the native people refer to raven as the trickster. Uh, they are remarkable birds. Um, so while there's a lot of action going on at the mouths of these salmon streams um, and in the estuaries, I noticed that many salmon make it past this gateway between ocean and land, and they keep swimming upstream uh, into the forest. Um, so this is kind of a perfect example of, of what's going on at this time of year. So the ocean is out here somewhere, and the salmon have left the ocean, they've entered that inner tidal, that estuary area, and they're kind of weaving their way among the different uh, channels of, the, of, the, of that estuary, and then they find the main <coughs> channel um, of the stream. And um, this whole black swarm here, that's all salmon. And I know, right? <laughs> and, and this is not unusual. People think, oh, well, you know, what, that's a special river that you went to, and it's like, Pretty much they all look like this, especially when the pink salmon are coming in, because the pink uh, can really come in in great numbers. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's just, that's all salmon there. Um, so again, they, they found this main channel and they keep going, like they head into the forest. And so um, I decide uh, to follow them and find out where they go. And to do this, I head to Wrangell Island, uh, where I meet up with uh, Brenda Schwartz uh, Jaeger. So Brenda is, she's fourth generation Alaskan, and her ancestors worked uh, in this area as bounty hunters, trappers, and, and big game guides. And Brenda tells me she's the first generation in her family uh, to be able to bring people to the Tongass and not take anything other than photographs. And Brenda says that in society today, um, we're all used to pushing a button and controlling our scenery you know, on a television screen, or controlling the temperature in our houses, or, or even controlling the sound you know, as to what we're listening to. But in a real wilderness, she says, uh, we quickly realize that we're not in control, and it's humbling. And she thinks it's good for us to be humbled. And I would agree with her on that one. And just a side note here, that, um, Arlene here um, in the front audience, or in the front row here, um, uh, arrived early and, I, and she told me that she uh, was a commercial fisherman in Alaska. And I said, oh, did you happen to know 
you know, Brenda Schwartz and her family said, yes, Brenda painted, uh, did a painting of my fishing boat. Um, it's right over there by the table. So I'm happy to say Brenda's an incredibly talented watercolor painter, painter as well. So definitely take a look at the painting um, at the end there. Um, so probably no other place that Brenda goes and takes people uh, allows people to experience wild Alaska better than a place called Anna and Creek. Uh, so off we go. Uh, headed back for the mainland, uh, zooming over the water in her boat, which she has named the Wild Side. So we moor the boat at the mouth of the creek, um, and we enter the forest on foot. It's mid-August, and the place is just thrumming with life as gobs of salmon are making their way upstream. Uh, the harpy screams of ravens are emanating from the forest. Uh, bald eagles uh, swoop from treetop to rock top, uh, eyeballing the feast uh, before them. Uh, hordes of Bonaparte gulls uh, descend upon the stream, and what they're doing is they're scooping up the salmon eggs, um, which have lots of activity going on. And so we keep hiking, and about a mile into the forest, um, the stream is pinched uh, by a series of waterfalls, and it's here where the salmon uh, are jammed up. And it's here where the bears, of course, gather for this all-you-can-eat buffet. So black bears are the star attraction here, but since Anna Creek is on the mainland and not one of the islands, um, brown bears occasionally show up too. And it's very interesting when they do to watch the, the dynamic uh, between the two uh, species. So the, the bears are wary of one another. Bears are not social animals. The only time you ever see bears together are if you see a mother with cubs, uh, maybe a, a male and a female mating uh, briefly, or in times like this, when the food supply is plentiful, they'll all gather and they'll somewhat tolerate each other's presence. Um, but there's a lot of, while this particular photo might look a little amusing to us, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of stress going on here uh, among the bears. They're all basically just trying to avoid each other, um, but still eat. Um, and there's definitely a hierarchy and it's, it's interesting to watch that pecking order uh, that goes on there. And in general with bears, uh, the bigger the bear, uh, the better the fishing spot. And I have to say that these are some of the healthiest bears I've probably ever seen. Uh, the place is, um, it's literally crawling with bears. And there's so much going on that I don't know where to point my camera. And I need to say that this is a really good problem to have as a wildlife photographer. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we can be out there for days, weeks, months, years, and, and hope that one animal walks by. And it just kind of depends on the species and, and where you are. But to just be overwhelmed with activity is, is uh, is actually a good thing. It could be frustrating, but it's good. <laughs> so I try to focus on the bears fishing um, when another bear uh, jumps onto the viewing platform. Um, this interrupts this interrupts my concentration just a little bit and forces me to move back. Uh, still another bear passes just a few feet uh, behind me. I'm pretty certain those two women had no idea that that bear was there. <laughs> and, and that's just a railing. That is not, as you saw, that's not going to stop a bear from doing anything. Very false sense of security uh, with that railing there. And um, yet another bear uh, hangs above me. So in this kind of place, you better be looking in front of you, behind you, and you might want to look up uh, every now and then. And so I start scratching my head. I'm like, and I'm saying, and for crying out loud, you know, who's watching whom? You know, am I am I watching the bears or are the bears watching me? I, mean, I think it's a little bit of both going on here. Um, but the good thing is, as long as you don't get in their way, I mean, they're they're so focused on those salmon. So you just have to avoid the path that they're taking to get to the salmon. Um, so after a few hours of just this crazy bear circus with these bears everywhere, um, I'm feeling like I've got some, some decent bear photographs. But what I really need are good salmon photographs. And believe it or not, they're really hard to get. Even though you could have a million salmon right in front of you, it's difficult to make it translate into something that, uh, that really looks like fish. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so, so now, now I'm honing in on the fish here. So fin to fin, uh, tail to tail, and they sway against the current as one giant log. And it's easy to forget that they're individual fish. They just look like one giant organism in the water. It's actually, it's actually pretty neat. Um, but you remember that they're individual fish when they start leaping, and they start springing uh, from the crowd, and, and they hurl themselves against this foaming wall of water. And then, and then another does this, and another does this. And, this goes on for hours, days, weeks. Um, but for the salmon, every minute is precious uh, as their time is coming to an end. Uh, they stop eating. They're in their final act, spawning, and they won't stop pushing upstream until they die. 
Uh, it's a testament to the power of their biological clock. You know, passing on their genes is their mission in life, and once accomplished, uh, they pay for it with their lives. Uh, that's the life cycle of Pacific salmon. Um, after spawning, uh, they die. So I always like to say that if you're a salmon, uh, there's no such thing as safe sex. <laughs> you spawn, you die. <laughs> And I always think maybe we should teach that to our young people. <laughs> <laughs> so stinking, rotten salmon carcasses are now everywhere. And uh, the stench is almost unbearable. I'm surrounded by death. But in death, there is life. And as I contemplate the life cycle of these incredible fish, um, a bear zooms up a tree with a salmon in its mouth. Could this be salmon in the trees? Well, technically, this is salmon up a tree. <laughs> so, how the heck do salmon get in the trees? Well, away from the creek, I spot a fresh salmon with a bite taken out of it uh, that had been dragged and dropped in the forest. And suddenly, the thing I'd been searching for was staring me in the face, and it all made perfect sense. The salmon, bears, trees, soil, bugs, roots, berries, birds, and the bees. It was all right here in this glorious cycle of life one of the greatest shows on Earth, and one that plays out all over the Tongass every year. So here's the deal. Scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon streams. Uh, this variant is called nitrogen 15, and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? Well, it swam there, in the bodies of salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But but how exactly does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. And now remember, bears don't really like being around other bears. So when they catch a fish, they will often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. And it turns out that bears can move a lot uh, of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in just eight hours. Um, right, so you think about there's almost 5,000 spawning streams here, millions of salmon uh, are filling those streams. Uh, this part of the world has one of the highest densities of both brown and black bears. Uh, one bear is carrying 40 fish from a stream in eight hours. Um, you, know, you do the math, that adds up to a lot of salmon that ends up into the forest. And toward the end of a good salmon season, um, the bears can afford to be picky, and at this point they're usually just targeting the richest parts of the fish, which is uh, the head, the eggs if it's a female, um, and the skin. So they're targeting the richest parts of the fish, and they leave the rest behind. Um, it certainly doesn't go to waste, though. Uh, other animals scavenge on these carcasses, and this spreads the nutrients farther uh, throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer uh, decomposes into the soil, and the trees and other vegetation absorb it through their roots. And scientists have actually uh, been able to trace nitrogen-15 in trees near salmon streams that they can link directly back to the fish. So that is how salmon uh, end up in the trees. Now, not to be outdone, uh, the trees return the favor by nurturing the salmon. So trees shade the spawning streams, and this keeps the water temperatures cool for the developing eggs. Uh, salmon are very sensitive to water temperature. Uh, the roots of the trees, this helps stabilize the stream banks, this prevents erosion from fouling the clean water and the gravel beds that the salmon need uh, to lay their eggs. Uh, and fallen trees create protected pools uh, pr and provide food for insects that then feed the young salmon. So in parts of the Tongass, uh, trees help grow salmon and salmon help grow trees. So kind of think of salmon as being part ocean and part forest. Now, when you understand this connection, this remarkable connection between salmon and trees, you quickly start to see other connections. Bald eagles fueled by salmon will soar greater distances to find food uh, during the lean winter months. Female bears padded with fat reserves uh, will give birth in the dens and nurse their tiny cubs uh, with salmon and rich milk. Uh, the forest, fertilized with supercharged soil from all those decayed fish, uh, will sprout new growth come spring. And, and what about those salmon? Well, as winter arrives and the last of the adult fish are spawned out and their nutrient-packed bodies are uh, picked clean, um, but they didn't die in vain. Swaddled in the streams and incubated by the forest, uh, their fertilized eggs will soon hatch that next generation, ensuring that the cycle of life here is a circle, always flowing and never broken. So I always like to say that in the Tongass, what goes around, comes around. 
And that goes for us too. Uh, salmon help us understand that we also need things like healthy forests and oceans for the gifts of clean water, air, and food. And what we do to the forest can affect the oceans, and what we do to the oceans can affect uh, the forests. So what, what's, what's the threat to the Tongass? Well, it's helpful to know a little bit of history. So uh, when Russians and Europeans arrived on these forested shores uh, in the 1700s, uh, they saw a land of super abundance, uh, and they started taking things. Uh, they started taking things like gold, uh, sea otter furs, whale oil, uh, and salmon. Uh, as well. Now, we were a little slow uh, to start uh, taking timber here in great quantities, uh, but that all changed after World War II. Uh, industrial scale logging uh, began here in earnest, and some of the great forests of the Tongass uh, began to fall. Uh, thousands of miles of logging roads and clear cuts have degraded parts of the Tongass, um, impacting some salmon streams uh, and the people and wildlife uh, who rely on them. Now keep in mind that as big as that Tongass is, 17 million acres, 40% uh, is not forested at all. It's rock, ice, wetlands. Only 30% of the Tongass uh, contains what are called uh, productive old growth forests with commercial timber value. And less than 3% of the entire Tongass um, consists of these, what are called these big tree productive uh, old growth forests. And these are among the areas most valuable to wildlife, uh, including salmon and the people uh, who rely on them. And while these forests are best known for their centuries-old giants, uh, they are in fact what are called uh, multi-aged or ageless forests. Uh, and I will, I'll explain what I mean by this. So when a giant falls, uh, like this one did here, it snapped off uh, on its own, um, this creates a gap in the canopy and this allows light to then reach the forest floor and this stimulates new growth. So saplings and shrubs then sprout and clamor for the sky in that, in that light. And um, eventually, uh, over long periods of time, all ages and sizes of trees create a, a multi-story uh, canopy. And in a forest like this, uh, in death, there is life. Uh, a fallen tree uh, here becomes uh, what's called a nurse log, and its decay provides nutrients for new trees um, uh, that may be growing on top of it, uh, like that one is. Uh, many, many decades later, um, we can see where that nurse log uh, used to be, now uh, often called a ghost log, uh, that nourished this tree that started its life uh, on top of it. A standing dead snag that is, provides homes and lookout spots uh, for all kinds uh, of critters. Uh, and the feast that the forest provides uh, nourishes many different animals as well. Um, this is Devil's Club, and uh, it's large clumps of berries. Turns out this is a critical food source uh, for bears and Devil's Club is one of the most important uh, medicinal and traditional plants uh, for the native uh, people. Uh, bunchberry, this is a critical food source uh, for the Sitka black-tailed deer, uh, particularly in the winter months. Uh, and the deer, in turn, uh, is an important food source for wolves, bears, and many, many local people here uh, fill their freezer uh, with the deer every fall. Um, so, so what happens uh, in a forest like this after all the trees are removed? Well, there is a lot of new growth at first. Um, again, now light is hitting that forest floor, and that stimulates uh, new growth. Um, this doesn't last very long, though. In a relatively short amount of time, um, just a few decades or so, the even-aged trees that then grow up, because they're all pretty much growing at the same time, uh, they create a closed canopy, and they, they shade out uh, any understory plants. Um, this particular forest was clear-cut about 60 years ago, and today, uh, biologically, it's a desert. Or, uh, again, there's no understory plants, there's nothing green in there for um, uh, animals, particularly the deer, uh, to, to eat. And, um, and while there are many parts of the Tongass that now look like that, um, um, and, and scientists have determined uh, that the forest will persist in this state for several centuries uh, before it begins to develop the uh, most complex structural characteristics of uh, productive old growth forest again. So while trees are renewable, um, certainly, um, an old growth forest in this part of the world um, is not, not of any kind of human uh, time frame. So uh, North America's original coastal temperate rainforest, uh, which once extended intact uh, all the way from south central Alaska down into southeast, this is the Tongass, uh, into uh, coastal British Columbia, and then down into Washington, Oregon, and uh, northern California, that was all one continuous uh, forest at one time. So of that uh, amount, 
Uh, about 44% has been affected by things like um, urban development, uh, logging, or farming. And most of this has taken place uh, from Vancouver Island and British Columbia um, south. So anything uh, we see in red there has been developed in some way, and those, the original forests um, are now gone. Um, and in some parts, they're long gone. Uh, the mighty redwood forests of Northern California, uh, these were heavily logged by the late 1800s uh, during the gold rush era. And the once great forests of Washington and, and Oregon uh, were logged in the early 1900s uh, for spruce, cedar, and Douglas fir uh, to build airplanes and ships uh, during World War I. And with the passing of more than a century uh, here in these red areas, I mean, who among us today has a memory of what these forests uh, once contained? Now, I always have to be really careful when I give this presentation in these red areas, uh, because some people just don't believe me. They say, well, well, we have big trees, and we have some salmon, and, and it's like, and that's true. Uh, but you know, when you look at the, at the facts, it's, uh, it's, what are we, less than 4% of those original forests uh, remain in the red areas, and I think we're at about 2% of our historical salmon runs. Um, so again, while we do have those things, it's just the, the numbers have been incredibly uh, diminished. Now, I'm a, there's a lot of great work uh, going on in these red areas. In my home state of Washington, we just uh, took out two dams on the Elwha River. Salmon are coming back much quicker than anyone expected. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. So that is like really encouraging news. And I know uh, here as well, um, there's a lot of efforts um, to restore fragmented forests and to uh, restore salmon runs as well. And I'm a big believer that we can and we should uh, bring back salmon and do whatever we can um, to restore uh, these ecosystems, and we should definitely support the people uh, and the groups that are doing uh, that, that great work. Um, but, uh, as any of you know, who are doing work like that, it's really difficult to bring something back uh, once it's been gone. Um, and part of the reason why I pursued telling the story of the Tongass is that it's up here, uh, in, in what is mostly uh, a green area. Um, and remarkably, uh, in there, enough critical areas um, are still intact, and they're holding the ecological integrity of that whole place together. Um, all the species that existed at the time of European settlement are still here. Nothing is missing. That's pretty astounding uh, in the 21st century. Uh, brown bears um, wiped out in most of the lower 48 states. They live here, again, in some of the highest densities in the world, in part due to all of those healthy wild salmon runs. Uh, which in turn uh, support other species, as well as a viable fishing industry uh, that has been uh, managed very well and certified as one of the world's best examples of a sustainable fishery. Uh, humpback whales uh, find enough to eat to fuel their long migrations. Uh, the native people uh, still live where their ancestors have uh, since time immemorial. And all of the local people here uh, enjoy a very special uh, way of life. And visitors come here because there is no other place like it uh, on the planet. And the beauty of the Tongass is that it's relatively accessible. You know, a place like this with grizzly bears and salmon and, and just all these wild components is usually in a really remote place. It's expensive to get to, it's far away, there's no infrastructure, um, but this is not the case in Southeast Alaska. So you can go here, you can have an incredible wilderness experience if you want to. You won't see another human being for days. But you can also go here, watch grizzly bears fish for salmon, and be back in a really comfortable hotel room that same night. So I always encourage people uh, to go uh, if you can. Um, so visitors come here uh, for many different reasons. Uh, some come to walk in the rainforest. They've never seen a, a temperate rainforest. Uh, many come to see bears. Uh, they've never seen uh, brown bears. Um, some uh, adventurous types come to explore the unique cave features that exist on some of these outer islands. Uh, people definitely come to fish. We always like to say, in Alaska, you catch, you don't fish. <laughs> 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 and uh, definitely come to eat the best salmon in the world. Uh, to see glaciers, and if you're adventurous, uh, maybe even walk on one. Um, some crazy souls come here to scuba dive. Uh, again, very cold water, but incredible life uh, below the surface. Um, it's starting to get known as a surfing area, too. Again, very cold, but incredible waves, and you're not going to find crowds. <laughs> uh, it's a great place to canoe and, and portage a canoe. <laughs> uh, fabulous place to kayak because of all those protected uh, waterways. Um, a lot of people uh, come here to learn about the native cultures, uh, both the past uh, and the very much alive present. Um, and I think most people are just thrilled uh, to come here and be out on the ocean uh, watching for whales and 
you know, if they're lucky, uh, they might even see one for each. And I think when people come here for many different reasons, um, they all leave with a little piece of Alaska in their hearts. And personally, that's a really good thing to have in your heart. And um, while I came here uh, looking for salmon in trees, uh, I also found wonderful communities of people uh, everywhere that I, I went. Um, there aren't many places uh, in our country where you can find uh, fishing towns uh, anymore, um, or a state capital accessible only by boat or airplane. Uh, this is Juneau. It's the only way that you can get there. Um, or a boardwalk town with no roads or cars. This is Elton Cove. There's a woman here in the audience who um, spent the better part of her formative years living in Elton Cove. <laughs> this is a phenomenal place. When we were here, I think they said it's about population 100 in the summer and 12 in the winter. <laughs> and you were one of them. <laughs> uh, or towns here um, whose histories are not forgotten. This is Sitka. Uh, it used to be the Russian capital before the United States uh, owned uh, Alaska. Um, cultures here that have endured for millennia. Uh, I met people here whose lives ebb and flow with the rhythms of the place. And what I love most about the way of life here is that people don't really live by the clock. Uh, they live by the seasons. And their seasons are defined by very delicious things. Uh, things like salmon, uh, wild berries, and uh, deer uh, in the fall. And so whenever I come to Southeast Alaska, it, kind of a strange, but I think perfectly natural way, I, I feel like I'm coming home. This is how we're supposed to live, uh, in tune with the gifts that nature provides for us and, and connected to the very things uh, that nourish both our bodies and our spirits. Now, some of the most biologically critical areas of the Tongass um, are, are not protected, and threats to them include things like uh, continued logging, uh, mining, uh, industrial scale uh, tourism, um, energy development, uh, global climate change, uh, and, and who knows uh, what else down the road. Uh, probably things uh, we're not even thinking about today. <laughs> Yet despite these threats, um, I have hope. I think that we can get it right in the Tongass simply because there's still time to do so and we know it's the right thing to do. And we have an unprecedented opportunity uh, to ensure that these most biologically rich areas actually stay that way. So let us learn from the lessons that salmon and the trees teach us. Uh, that everything is connected, and that this most magnificent of rainforest thrives because all of its pieces still exist, and they, we are very much a part of this all uh, as well. Now globally, coastal temperate rainforests are rare, covering just one thousandth of the Earth's land surface. So anywhere we see on the map uh, in green, these are virtually the only places on the entire planet where this type of ecosystem has ever existed, and they're rare because they take just the right uh, conditions uh, for them to form. Um, the Tongass, uh, up here again, um, and, and North, North America was always the largest, uh, was the king of the coastal temperate rainforest of the world, always the largest. Um, and the Tongass, again, is up in that northern portion there. And the Tongass contains a third of the world's old growth temperate rainforest, uh, and the largest reserves uh, of intact old growth forest uh, left, left in our country. And it's ranked among the top 10 national forests in the United States for its ability to store carbon and regulate global climate. So it's not just important that people live there, uh, it's important for all of us uh, worldwide. So as you can see, we've been given a great gift. And I think with that comes uh, a great responsibility as well. Uh, the Tongass is public land. It's been entrusted uh, to all of us. Uh, we all have a say what happens here, whether we live in Alaska, Oregon, Illinois, or Florida. Uh, it belongs to all of us. And it is my greatest hope uh, that the Tongass will always be a place where there are salmon in the trees. Thank you. Did I spend the winter there? No. I, I was one of those wimpy Lord 48 people who loved the summer and, and not sure how people live there in the winter. <laughs> although, although the winter in Southeast Alaska is similar to here. I mean, it's a maritime climate. It's oh, not. Yeah, yeah it, it's varied over the years. It does. Yeah. It does. Do you know, 
actually has as a great little ski area it does too. Impress. Yeah. Yeah, Juno is amazing. It's 30,000 people uh, in the capital. It's phenomenal. They've got a symphony, a ski area. It's, it's an amazing town. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh -huh. Can you talk about what happens when the brown bears encounter the black bears? Or do you actually witness any of it? <laughs> yes, what happens when the brown bears encounter the black bears? Uh, the black bears cower. <laughs> they just, even those big, really healthy black bears are just like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> start backing away. Uh, the brown bears are just, it's, it's amazing to watch both, and it's amazing to watch both of them together. The brown bears just move with this, they just swagger. I mean, they just swagger in, and they just move with this confidence, and, and I, I'm guessing it's because you know, they're, they've just evolved to where they're the king of the forest. I mean, nothing, um, they don't back down to anything. Uh, maybe people sometimes, kind of depends on the bear. Um, and, and, and just their sheer size. Um, I don't think it always gets the black bear's attention, but it's it is interesting to watch. <laughs> uh -huh. Is that your foot hanging over the wing of the airplane? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was my foot hanging over the wing of the airplane. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I was kind of I was up there terrified, right? And I'm like, okay, maybe to get rid of my fear, I'm going to start taking pictures because that makes me feel more comfortable. Right? Yeah. And so I tried to put my foot out a little bit. Bad idea. If you've ever been in a plane and just tried to stick your hand out of the window, that's when you realize just how fast you're going. So, yeah, I was lucky I didn't lose it, and I could pull it back. <laughs> yes. Uh, how bad is the mosquito? How bad are the mosquitoes? You know, in Southeast Alaska, they're not bad. Where mosquitoes really get bad is further north in the interior of Alaska. The interior is very, very different climate, and it's the interior is much more swampy and boggy, and that's where the mosquitoes breed. It's just not too bad. The no seams can be really biting bad. Biting flies. Yeah. Biting flies. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The biting flies. It's the other bugs that are pretty bad, but but they're no, not anything like the swarms that you see in other. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm just curious about you using the term brown bear rather than grizzly. Is that oh, yeah, great question. Yeah, brown bear versus grizzly bear. There was a time when taxonomists were classifying uh, different populations of brown bears as actually different species, and they've stopped pretty much stopped doing that. And they're all they're all the common name is brown bear. Um, grizzly bear gets its name from. I may get this wrong. I think the coastal bears that tend to look more have a grizzled coat, so kind of more of like a white-tipped coat. I mean, that's where they got their name. But um, when, when you hear grizzly brown, it's the same it's the same species, or versus arctos. There is a subspecies, um, I think it's the Kodiak uh, brown bear, which are, I think are the largest um, in the world. But yeah, all, all same species. Anyone else? Okay, well, um, oh, John. Uh, you, you mentioned the climate change in passing but I think it's worth also noting it was at the importance of the topic as we face climate change, species down here like salmon will become increasingly in danger. And protecting those refuges and those pockets for them will become even more important. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, as as we feel the effects or see the effects more of, of climate change, you know, areas where Intact ecosystems where they're thriving um, are going to become even more important and almost kind of, I hate to use the word procedure, but you know, refuges really for, um, for things like salmon and, and the grizzly bears. And, yeah, it's, and then it's important to note too, salmon are, are very sensitive, as, as tough and hardy and as resilient as those fish are, they are amazing. They are very sensitive to uh, temperature, water temperature. They need just the right temperature uh, for those eggs to develop. I think uh, Biologist told me I think it's anything over 40 degrees uh, is too warm for them. Um, so not only do they need just the right temperature of the water, but they need just the right amount of water to be uh, hitting those spawning streams um, at, a, at a certain time of the year. And that's, yeah, the timing of everything is kind of getting all screwed up um, with climate change. So it's going to be interesting to see how, um, how salmon fare up there and down here um, as well. Another thing I recently read, I think this is brand new science, is we used to think that the younger trees were actually, uh, yeah, I know, how, I always get confused on this, but they, they, uh, young, younger trees were uh, absorbing more carbon. Yeah, capturing carbon, carbon. Right, capturing more carbon. But the new science is actually showing that it's the older trees that are actually more beneficial than the younger trees. So that's, that's brand new. I think that's in the last several years. 
So again, even more reason to um, you know preserve what we can uh, up there and down here as well. Okay, if there aren't any more, um, I'm around here for a little bit, and please take a look at um, Arlene's beautiful boat painting. <laughs> it's cool. It just speaks to that part of the world too, just uh, the weather and how gorgeous it is. But yeah, thank you very, very much for coming.